I'm Dr. Brick Lance. I'm a uh, private practice orthopedic surgeon in Eugene, Oregon. I joined CMDA in 1982. I think CMDA is such a blessing for a lifetime career in medicine and uh, have not looked back. I cherish the relationships. CMDA matters. It really, really matters in your own life and for our communities. Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Well, I want to start out this week's episode by saying thank you to all of you who have already graciously responded to our year-end giving campaign goal of $900,000. We've only just begun, and we still have a ways to go to achieve this faith-stretching goal. You know, as a faith ministry, your CMDA depends on the generosity of many to bring the hope and healing of Christ to our world through healthcare professionals. Ministries like Global Health Outreach, campus and community ministries, which reach groups on 350 United States healthcare campuses, or our growing advocacy efforts, they cannot have the impact that they are having without your financial partnership. When you give, you're stepping in to inspire and transform lives for Jesus Christ. Would you please take a minute to visit cmda.org slash give to give your gift online, or you can just contact the stewardship team at 888-230-2637 or use email stewardship at cmda.org. Well, I've been looking forward to our interview with this week's guest, for quite some time, and I was even more intrigued by the release of her latest book, which is called Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. In this powerful book, Rosaria Butterfield uses scripture to confront five common lies about sexuality, faith, feminism, gender roles, and modesty, topics which are often promoted in today's secular culture. Rosaria's new book explores her personal battle with these lies. So let's listen in to hear more from Rosaria about God's redemptive work in her own life. Well, today on CMDA Matters, it is definitely a privilege. I've been actually waiting a couple of years to have my guest on this program today, Mrs. Rosaria Butterfield, and she comes highly recommended by the CMDA Educator of the Year this year, Dr. Andre Van Maul, who's been on the program a couple of times, our subject matter expert on all things uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And so Rosaria is a personal friend. In fact, he asked me to send you greetings this morning on the program, Rosaria. Well, I love I love Andre, and I love CMDA, so I'm very happy to be here. Let me tell our listeners just a little bit about you. Rosaria got her Ph.D. from Ohio State University and uh, is an author, pastor's wife, homeschool mom, and a former professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University in New York, written several books in the past. Some of you listeners may have heard of one or two of them. And in fact, my predecessor, our CEO emeritus, Dr. David Stevens, five years ago this month, uh, released a conversation <laughs> with my guest today on her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. But she's also written The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert and Openness Unhindered. But today we're going to talk about her newest book, just released by Crossway Publishing in September, entitled Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. So welcome today to CMDA Matters, uh, Rosaria Butterfield. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you all. As we get started, I I think it's really important because of the content of this book and uh, some really powerful stuff, I must admit. I've spent the last uh, seven days in fifth gear reading through it, and uh, I think I want to go back through a second time not in fifth gear and uh, digest a little bit more, but in preparation for this interview, your story is really a very important part of this book and why 
with authority and confidence, you can talk about the five lies. So would you tell our listeners just a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was converted to Christ 24 years ago. And where I was in life at that point was a lesbian activist professor at Syracuse University. I was one of the first crop of tenured radicals in New York. I specialized in critical theory, specifically queer theory. I was happily partnered with a woman who was also a professor at a neighboring university. And I had started working on a book, basically trying to figure out why evangelical Christians just wouldn't leave consenting adults alone. You remember, you might remember that was the key phrase a couple of decades ago, consenting adults alone. You haven't heard that phrase in a while, and we can talk a little bit about why that is. And I, I, you know, I'm an English professor, so I don't, I have to read books in order to make sense of things. And so in the process, I had written a couple of things that caused a few dust ups among Christians, and it brought a couple of Christians into my life. And one of those Christians was Pastor Ken Smith of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church and his dear wife, Floy. And they Well, actually, at first, I thought they were just going to be my unpaid research assistants for this book, right? Because, you know, they knew the Bible and I didn't. And I needed to understand why Christians believed that this book meant the things that they said it did. But after reading through the Bible seven times, meeting with Ken and Floyd hundreds of times for hundreds of meals in their home, I came to a shattering realization, and that's that the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed true, uh, that his resurrection is true, and that that would be true whether I believed it or not. That was a truth over which I had no, you know, interpretive authority. And at that point, I did sort of wonder, I mean, it seemed to me like, okay, I can see how this gospel is good news for some people, but how could it be good news for me as a lesbian? Like that, you know, that's not very logical. And that began a very challenging journey. I, I, I recount that journey in my book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. One of the things that I learned, I learned a lot of things, and I, I learned something that's very relevant to our discussion today. I learned that God created people with a purpose and for a pattern. And that's all people, not Christian people, not some people, not people who don't identify as gay, you know. All people. Psalm 100 says all people that on earth do dwell. And so so that the idea of the created order and the creation ordinance was a very troubling one to me as a lesbian and especially troubling, realizing that at least according to the dictates of the Bible, I was in rebellion against the most basic idea in the history of all ideas So uh, my conversion was messy. It was complicated. But one of the things that I learned is that it's not enough to repent of the sin of your practice, of what you're doing. You have to deal with the heart. The entire 10th commandment is about the heart. Coveting is done in the heart. Coveting is not done in a material way. I mean, it often is expressed in a material way, but it starts in the heart. And so the admonition, do not covet, is the admonition, do not desire. Do not desire that which God prohibits. And I really came to learn that when you repent of your sin at its root, and you pray that the Lord would develop in you healthy desires, the right ones, there are these things called rights and wrongs, that well, that the Lord answers your, your prayers. And although my conversion was messy and complex and not easy, I am now, I would, I consider my lesbian days a time of confusion. I consider that a, a false identity. I don't think that that was true. It was real, if that makes sense. And that's as far as I lived it, but it was not ontological. It was not true. It was not the person I was really meant to be. And I am very grateful that at this point in my life, you know, a quarter century out, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a pastor's wife. And yes, I mean, do the sins of my youth, do they ever pop up in my life? They do, not as desires, not as something I pine for or long for, but it's actually something I'm quite ashamed of. They show up in body memories or, or dreams. But I know I know who I belong to and I know what I am not. And I am not a lesbian. 
And part of what you see today is this very bad idea that started probably in the garden, but that really the, the evangelical church wasn't able to respond to adequately. This question of, can I be gay and Christian? Can I sanctify these desires and somehow, you know, repackage them so that they could give glory to God? We didn't stop that conversation where it needed to be stopped. And so now we have a situation where transgenderism, which is in some ways the logical ideological expression of the same rebellion against the created order is now just wreaking havoc in every single discipline and every quarter of the earth. And we need to, um, you know, you referenced um, Dr. Andre Von Mall. He is a dear friend of mine. And one of the things he said to me a few years ago is, Rosaria, you know, if we could get the, the, the pastor and the counselor and the medical doctor all in the same room with somebody, we might be able to actually do some good. <laughs> and so the idea that we are body and soul, uh, and that is really key. So part of why I wrote this book is, do you see this evil world? Well, the thumbprints of Rosaria Butterfield are all over them. Mm -hmm. When I was a lesbian, I was not just like the lesbian next door. I was an activist. I testified before uh, New York policymakers. I wrote policy. I helped make this world. And so although I absolutely know I'm forgiven and I thank the Lord for that, I'm still a grandmother. And if somebody makes a mess, you need to clean it up. And so <laughs> this book is my attempt to clean up a big mess that and I've you, made. And you must drive a lot of people crazy who are still in that life today when you show up and they don't think people can change and uh, oh, yeah. that things are innate. I, I wanted your story. I, I think I'd, I'd heard about it, but I'd not read it before. And so having read through this book, The Five Lies, there's a tendency, I think, even in the evangelical church to, to, to say that the, the Word of God, they won't say this, but the Word of God gets in the way, especially the Old Testament. But your story is that Genesis and Psalms, that Hebrews 4.12, that, God, that God's Word kept chipping away at you and your heart. And yes, there were great messengers, great ambassadors, and Pastor Ken and his wife, Floyd, and yet it was God's Word and hymns that really got through to your heart. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I'm an English professor, so I actually have to think about how a book works hermeneutically. I don't get to just read it with a kind of peace and joy that I think everybody else gets. But it didn't take long, maybe my first or second read through the Bible, to realize that the seeds of the gospel are in the garden. If you don't have your sin nature in Adam, you don't have any need for your redemption and ransom in Christ. So this idea that you can just be a New Testament Christian, you can just have, you know, some of those red letters that you like is not Christianity. It's some kind of religion, but it's not Christianity. And it, again, the what really fingered me, I'd say, would have to have been something like the way that Romans 7 positions indwelling sin, because at some point I had to come to this understanding, well, where did my homosexuality come from? It came from Adam. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to say. It, ca it came from my sin nature. And in Romans 7, you know, the Apostle Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do? It is the law of sin in me. And so he, he doesn't say it's who I am. He doesn't say, you know, but I'm a gay Christian. I mean, being a lesbian is part of my image bearing of God. That's nonsense. What homosexuality and transgenderism, what they are theologically is they're found in the flesh, they're forbidden in the law, and they're overcome in the Savior. So you can't be made in the image of God as a lesbian. You can't be made in the image of God as a trans activist or a binary whatever. And that is because all of those things, transgenderism and homosexuality, are part of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So and, that, that addresses, uh, Rosaria, two of the lies, which is the first okay. one, and I think the third one, if, if I'm not mistaken, or the fourth one, about homosexuality being normal, transgenderism being normal. And you make a distinction about being made in God's image, not made as God's image. Could you take a deeper dive on that? Yeah, absolutely. So what it means to be made in an image, you know, just think about like you you know, we stood in the mirror this morning, we brushed our teeth and we looked at our image. And the minute we walked away from the mirror, our image wasn't there, right? Yeah, you know that. And so in order to be made in the image of God, you need to be staring at God, not yourself. Mm -hmm. 
So you're looking at God and what you're, what are you looking at when you look at God? Well, you're looking at knowledge and righteousness and holiness. So to grow in the image of God is to grow in the communicable attributes of God, to grow in the knowledge, the righteousness, and the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But my flesh has a totally different, you know, jive going on. And it is it has nothing to do with growing in the knowledge, the, the holiness, and the righteousness of God. But what people often say when they use the words gay Christian is they'll say, well, you know, I've always felt this way. So what? <laughs> so what? I, I mean, almost any sin of the flesh that you can talk about, you've probably, for as long as you've been conscious of the way you operate, you have felt those things. The real challenge is that homosexuality and transgenderism are the only sins literally written into the civil law. They are the only sins that come with civil rights protections. And so that's where sometimes evangelical Christians and gay rights activists get into this, you know, this kind of conflict because the evangelical Christian will say, I don't understand. What do you mean you can be a gay Christian? Um, you know, do you want to say you're a pornographic Christian or you're a, you know, avaricious Christian or you're an adulterous Christian? And then the gay rights activist says, wait, 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 you're talking apples and oranges. Homosexuality is a protected category of personhood. God can't touch me there and you can't touch me mm. there. And that's where it just really helps to stop and realize when you're talking across people and say, no, actually, homosexuality is part of the world, the flesh and the devil. Very, it very, very well in this particular cultural climate be protected by both civil and federal law. But that doesn't change what it actually is is. And I am convinced that should the Lord Jesus Christ tarry, and historians have many, many years to reflect on these years, this particular age will be remembered in the infamy of Moloch. And you remember the great idol, you know, Moloch, the, you know, children were thrown live, into the fire. Yes. Live children were sacrificed. So, but at a certain point, Hezekiah stopped that practice. Like he destroyed that. And how do idols, how do you stop idols? This might be really important. You don't negotiate with them. You don't sit down with them and say, oh, let me try, if I, let me see if I can empathize with you and see things from your point of view. You go to war against them. You destroy them and you don't even ask questions about it. I think that this is where it's challenging for evangelical Christians because we don't seem to know how to engage the gospel in a hostile world. It's almost like we're taught that's not appropriate. And yet, you know, I am here to tell you that you can go to a school board meeting, you could go to your legislature, you have your three minutes, you can smile, you say your piece, and then after you do that, the whole room starts crying or swearing or hissing, or booing. And if you've been a grown-up for any period of time, you've probably walked into a room full of children, usually your own, spoken for three minutes, and everybody cries. I don't <laughs> see what the difference is. I think we just have to be willing to be present in these ways. But yes, no, you, you, this is very serious. And what's also very frustrating about it, I think, and probably especially so for medical professionals, is this isn't subtle. The problem is right before our very eyes. Mm -hmm. At what point can I possibly believe that the biological reality of maleness and femaleness is not inherently true about someone? Like, what would I have to give up to believe that? And that's where you kind of get that other lie in, the lie about feminism being good for the church and the world. Because one of the important feminist theoretical contributions was this idea that there is a difference between sex and gender. This idea that you have biological sex, and yes, we understand as a woman, you, you have creational you know, properties, but if your IQ is over 120, you know, you might want to do something way more interesting. I, if you, I hope you hear the sarcasm because I think there's nothing more important than Absolutely. being a wife and a mother. But, you know, you might you might feel called to do things that have nothing to do with being a woman. And that's gender. And so we have to make a distinction between sex and gender. But the Bible makes no such distinction. 
the creation ordinance, uh, Genesis 127, 128, says you are made in the image of God as a man or as a woman. And that, that, that being a man and being a woman has patterned purposes. So God isn't some master engineer that builds a bridge to fall into a lake. We are created in a way for a purpose, and part of that purpose has to do with our eternity. And so the reason I, I mention this now is that transgenderism is simply the logical extension of this. All transgenderism has done is taken that feminist principle, which is not accurate, it is not biblical, it is not true, that there's a difference between sex and gender, and has simply taken it to its logical conclusion and said, okay, we just want gender. We deny sex entirely. We're going to use something like assigned at birth. Like we're going to, we're going to flip this upside down. We're going to say that our perceived gender rooted in our feelings is real, but our biological sex was just somebody assigning it through this cultural frame. We reject that. And part of why this becomes really significant to think about is I do know Christians who want to say, well, I like some things about feminism. Well, you can like some things about poison if you want to, but think about the logical consequences of that sex gender distinction. It's lethal. But what's never lethal, what's always life giving is the gospel. So when I speak to school boards and I speak to the legislature, I am not the person holding up images of castrated 14 year old boys or, you know, mutilated 15 year old girls. And the reason is because we want those people to come to Christ. And we as Christians know, and especially I would say as medical doctors, you know, we don't throw anybody away. We don't hold anybody up as an example of what not to be. And we know that if that person commits his or her life to Jesus, that in the new Jerusalem, they will be made complete and well. You can't mock God. And that's the very good news. Rosario, one of our main strategic objectives that we have in our current plan is to equip our members to be loving messengers of truth. And there's, there is this dynamic tension always at play. You've been alluding to it just a little bit between being winsome with love versus the comp- never wanting to compromise God's truth. Where, where do you think, think that the evangelical church is today in terms of trying to manage that tension and take yeah. a broad swath of the evangelical church? Yeah, I think it's a disaster. And I think part of why it's a disaster it's, is that it's been following false teachers who profess a false doctrine, you can and you must repent of sins of the flesh. The sins of the flesh are not ontological. They're not part of your being. They're part of your flesh and you are and you must overcome them in Christ. And Christ is powerful. As his Christians, we want to profess in the world a gospel of liberty of salvation, of victory over your sins. My husband's a pastor. He works with men from a rescue mission. Can you imagine talking to somebody who's homeless and on the street and drug addicted and saying, well, God's not really going to change you, you know, because because God doesn't do that. But he loves you. And that is what the broad evangelical church has said around this issue of homosexuality and transgenderism. And I think it's because they are a bunch of cowards, I really genuinely do. And I know people have told me, especially young people, I'm not connecting with young people anymore. And I tell people, no, I'm really connecting with you. I'm connecting with you the way that your mother's spanking spoon connected with your raw behind. (laughs) Uh, Believe me, there's a connection. You might not like it, but just stick with me here. Because the gospel does give you victory. And as as medical professionals, when you want to heal somebody, I don't think you want to make them a medical patient for life. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's quite counterintuitive to why any of you went to medical school in the first place. And so I think what we need to do, and my husband has said this in sermons a lot in the last couple of years, Christians have to be willing to lose things for Christ. We have to be willing to lose honors and accolades. Maybe we have to lose our job. I don't know. We don't want to give ADF too much more work, but we might need to. Um, 
we want to give glory to God, but we also want to be very mindful. But the way that these broad evangelical movements have co-opted that term is to say, we're going to be a soft presence. Well, newsflash, you live in a dangerous world. You cannot be a false, you know, a soft presence in Sodom and come out any better than Lot. That, you know, think it through, Christian. You know, and, and I would say, too, that there's Aiken in the camp, that we've got sin in the camp, and that's part of the problem. Part of why Christians have a really hard time calling other people to repent of their favorite sins is I think too many Christians are coddling secret sins in their own heart, which makes it really hard to boldly call other people to die to them. And I don't have any, I only have anecdotal evidence on that. I'm a pastor's wife who just, you know, I don't, I don't do hard data, but there's something wrong right now. There, it used to be that the gospel would go forward and it was distinctive. When we think about gender dysphoria and the rare condition that it formerly was, it almost never came up, even very experienced pediatric uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists might see one or two cases in their career, and now it's everywhere. And so you talk about the sin of envy, and I honestly have never heard anyone tie that with the transgender tsunami or revolution. And I think it's because there'll be that rare case when it's not really envy. It is a psychiatric diagnosis that normally hit boys in the past. But now, truly, the way we see transgenderism now, it's all about envy. Talk to our listeners about the sin of envy and transgenderism. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say even in, uh, you know, I'm not obviously, I'm a, I have a PhD in English, so you never want to call me a doctor because the only thing I can fix is your metaphor and nobody seems to need help with their broken <laughs> metaphors. But um, I, have, although, I, have, I have some broken ones from time to time. Some, yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, there's a, there's a corner for it. But, you know, uh, my understanding is the medical analog, even for the rare condition of gender dysphoria, is anorexia. And even there, you would not suggest, oh, I, you just need a sticker and a parade. You know, that's all you need to feel. So so you can just see there's a whitewashing all the way through. But transgenderism, I mean, back in the gay community, we had a somewhat crass phrase. I know we're G-rated, but I think I think this will fly. <laughs> you can, we're taped, so you can cut it out if you need to. But <laughs> homosexuality meant knowing who you wanted to go to bed with. Transgenderism meant knowing who you wanted to go to bed as. Hmm. And so transgenderism has always had this veneer or this paradigm of being looked at and this idea of the image I'm projecting and the need to affirm. So if I'm projecting an image, the only way that that image can be true, if it's not actually true, is if I get you to be my mirror that nods and smiles, because I look in the actual mirror and I see what I see and I'm not pulling it off yet. But now you have the promise of three things, and especially for the adolescent female. You have the promise of a social transition. You have the promise that you can go to your government school with its anti-bullying legislation that is all about promoting transgenderism in the guise of Title IX and and, uh, you know, 14th Amendment and the application of the Bostock decision. And I can go, I can be 12 years old and I can say, you know, call me Joseph. <laughs> and, and I go by the pronouns he and they. And then after a while, that social transition isn't enough because I want more. There's something that is churning inside me that wants more. And so now I want testosterone. And so it's okay. I can go to Planned Parenthood and get some. No problem. No problem at all. But then after a while, the, the you know, testosterone isn't enough. And, and I, you know, every time I get, even though I don't get a period quite as often as I, as I, as I would normally, but with testosterone, but still I, I have to, I have to do more. And so I want a double mastectomy and a hysterectomy. And now I'm a medical patient for life. And now I every and, and I need more and I need more and I need more. And the Bible calls that envy. And, you know, envy has always flown under the radar. 
You know what I mean? Like, it's just not that kind of sin that people get too terribly worked up about. But we know that it's rottenness to the bones, said Pro- you know, says Proverbs. Worse than wrath and worse than anger, I was reading this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, but, but it flies under this radar of victimization. You know, I'm needing these things because I am a victim. And if I don't get them, I'm going to die. And so now you have the, you know, the radicalized gender ideologue counselor talking to a confused parent and says, well, would you rather have a dead son or a living daughter? And, and of course, if, if you're a Christian, it's th- that that seems pretty much like blackmail because it is because you want your children. You do want your children to cut some things off. It's just not their body parts. You actually want them to cut off the deeds of the flesh, just as you want to cut those off. You want to die to the deeds of the flesh. So there are things you do want to cut off and you want them to cut off. It's just not healthy body parts. But the other thing about envy is envy is never satisfied, which is why it's the opposite of love. It is never satisfied. There is never a point at which the envious person, whatever the object of your envy is, if it's money, if it's changing your body, whatever it is, there's never a point at which the envious person says, okay, I'm satisfied. I've got what I want. This becomes especially challenging when you think about homosexuality and transgenderism. Romans 1, which is probably the the heaviest lifting when it comes to a theological treatise against homosexuality, ends with an understanding in line 26 that if you cannot receive a blessing from God, you will demand it from men. And I think that's what you're really seeing here with transgenderism. There is a demand for affirmation. And this is also where the thinking Christian needs to say, well, wait, 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 wait. If you're okay, why do you need my affirmation? Like, you know, like sort of what's going on here? If everything's great, why do I need to join the sticker rainbow parade? What's going on? And I think two things you need to see are happening. One is in the Obergefell decision in 2015, that included something called the Dignitary Harm Clause that redefined what harm meant legally when it came to LGBTQ plus things. It used to be that harm meant um, something material. Um, I didn't, you know, I lost my job for no reason or you wouldn't sell me a pizza. But after Obergefell, harm means failing to affirm someone's LGBTQ identity. That sounds pretty Orwellian, but that's right there in a Supreme Court uh, document. Yes. And so this is where thinking Christians need to have a theology of disobedience, a theology that says, I've had to answer the question, whom do I believe? And I've had to answer it in a way that tells me I can't go there. And I'm going to have to pay the price for that. Rosario, I I definitely don't want to finish this interview without having you address the issue of acceptance and approval. It mm-hmm. it seems that these are not issues that other parents with young adults and teens have. I have board members. I have area directors, people in my church. I have close friends across the country who have had kids or siblings, in a couple of cases, parents. And uh, these lies have just caused yeah. fault lines in these families and the difficulty of trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, that truth and, and love. And yet you finish up the book with some advice. So talk a little bit about what are key principles in maintaining a loving relationship with our young adult kids who are being led astray, and maybe won't, are threatening not to ever see us or talk to us again. Right, right, right. And I think that 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 is called blackmail, right? And so that is the reality that so many of the people who write into my website or come to our church want to talk about. And it's really, really serious. And it's this, if you don't affirm me, you don't love me. And first of all, like, I think the before we talk about what you should do, as a parent, we need to talk about how you should think about this, right? Um, the proverb says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So we need to get our think a thing in order here. You know, 25 plus years ago, Ken Smith 
the first time we met was able to say, Rosaria, I accept you as a lesbian, but I don't approve. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that offended me. Uh, why would I expect an evangelical Christian to approve? Had he not read his own Bible? <laughs> like it, it did not occur to me that I, and I, it all, I had a whole, you know, community full of approving people. I didn't need these people also. So that those terms were completely fine. And I think, first of all, we need to get back to those terms. Here's a couple of ways to do it. As a parent, keep your child's history. I know that might mean you need to rent a pod and put it in your backyard, but keep the pottery, keep the pictures, keep the clothes, keep the things that are true to that person. You will need those. She will need those someday. One of the things that transgenderism, really and homosexuality seek to do is rewrite history. So you have to be the keeper of history. And the second thing you want to do is try very hard to stay connected without becoming indoctrinated. And so to that end, you need to think about each situation differently. I would say you probably cannot go to your son's gay wedding, but can your son and his partner come to your home for Thanksgiving dinner? Well, why not? And maybe you'd say, well, whoa, 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 I've got grandchildren. Okay, okay, that's, a, that's an important thing to think about. And then maybe you have the question, who needs me more? My children and grandchildren who are in the Lord or my prodigal son and his partner? You know, so I'm not saying there aren't hard choices, but, and, and be sure, the first thing you want to do, please, please make sure you're in a church that can handle these questions strongly. If you're in a church that says, oh, I don't know, there are three sides to the story, or, you know, maybe he really is a girl or any of that, just flee. You cannot, you don't have time right now. You're, you're on the front line of a battle. It's going to kill you. You got to get to a good church. But also, you know, take heart, you know, in stories and other people's, you know, conversion stories. Laura Perry Smaltz uh, has written a book called From Transgender to Transformed. She lived for 10 years as Luke, full beard, testosterone, had a full medical, quote unquote, transition. And during that whole time, her faithful, loving, godly parents stayed connected with her. I think met for her, met with, went out to dinner once a week for that whole time, but refused to call her Luke. And when, when they were in a social situation, my understanding is that they didn't intentionally expose her, but they would call her something like honey or dear or um, my child. I mean, using words that are full and rich with connection. But when Laura came to Christ, she went right back to the church of her childhood that had been praying for her for 10 years wow. and to her parents and many, many people, she's a dear friend of mine. I love her dearly. And many people I've, I've seen her in so many interview situations, people say, well, but wait a second, you know, aren't you called to be a bridge to the trans community? And shouldn't you be in a church that cares about being missional? And, and Laura's like, well, uh, no, I mean, I'm called to be a godly woman is what I'm called to be. Mm -hmm. And why would I go to the liars? Why would I go to the broad evangelical church that says that you should use preferred pronouns? Why should I go to any of those places? I went to the people who didn't lie to me. They never lied to me. They loved me and they didn't lie to me. And so during those 10 years, was it tough for Laura's parents? I mean, of course it was. And were they the object of some vitriol about how you don't really love me because you won't blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But they knew the truth. And they knew John 8, 31 and 32, that if you abide in the truth, the truth will set you free. They didn't think that they should abide in pragmatism, abide in winsomeness, abide in lying of any, of any kind. And, you know, they very faithfully, as often as their daughter would allow them, would go out to dinner, stay connected, listen about life. And so I think that that is the challenge. And so what I did in the appendix of the book, I have two appendices in the book, but one of the appendices is 
how to stay connected without becoming indoctrinated. Now, are those things going to be easy? No, it probably will require a great deal of changing your own patterns. And why? Because this is war. Because when you're when you're enlisted in a war, you eat differently, you sleep differently, you have a different barrack, and this is war. You are fighting for your child. It is the most important fight of your life. So will it be difficult? Yes. Will you need to change patterns? Yes. Do you have any room to be sentimental? No. If you are in a bad church because of your sentimentality, know that that's going to work against your own desires to help your child. So yes, you will have to make some really hard decisions with yourself, just at your own level. But you want to be in a strong position to fight for your child. And part of what you you need is about 100 other parents praying for their prodigals too, because you know what? Sometimes it's easier to pray for somebody else's prodigal and have them pray for yours Mm -hmm. and to know who they are. And you can hold each other up and uplift each other. So so yes, that those are all really important. And, and each, you know, as you know, as you read the book, each scenario is different. Some are things that are just hard stops, hard no's. Others are things that you really need to, to negotiate and think through the, the implications of. And my strong suggestion is that you, you make sure that you are praying with your pastor and your elders so that they can guide you through. Uh, these are hard days. In some ways, there hasn't, most of our pastors have not had a homiletics class on how to preach about transgenderism. No, you know, it haven't. just, you know, my husband actually has preached now three sermons about transgenderism, but, um, but I don't know that anybody else has. But as a, god, a godly woman, I just want to thank you for your transparency and how God and the Holy Spirit walked you through a journey and that what you believe now and express in your book is not necessarily exactly even maybe a couple of years ago or earlier in terms of pronoun use and because this is complicated. Just share with us, how did you sure. come to a point where I'm, I'm actually wrong, even just the godly woman, Rosaria Butterfield, I'm wrong about my perspective on personal pronouns. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, sh- I guess I should say that the book begins with my repenting of all the ways I believed all of these lies and even as a Christian. And so I just, I'm a public figure, so my repentance has to be public. And so what I would say about that is hopefully every morning we get up and the Holy Spirit, as we're reading the Bible, is re- is calling us to repent of a sin. And so the pronoun use one, so in my own conversion story, there was a man named Matthew. Only I didn't know that his name was Matthew. I only knew him as Jill. And the way that I learned that his name was Matthew was the day that he gave me his entire theological seminary uh, library. Because Matthew was a pastor, had been a pastor for 15 years before his fetish became an envy over which he had no control. And by the time I met Matthew, he had lived as exclusively as Jill for almost a decade. And although didn't pass too terribly well because of his size, he was six foot four, which is unusual for a woman. Still, there had been enough medical changes that it would be a hard call. It was actually Matthew, whom I only knew as Jill, who told me that he would pray for me because God didn't heal him, but he prayed that I could get out. And so I say these things. So I, I, I literally only knew this person in one way. And then one day, one day, you know, it was a while, uh, it, it was, it was deep into our friendship, but I had this strange, I was looking at this friend I knew as Jill, but I knew that, that deep down, this was really Matthew And I remember thinking, wait a second, there's a deserted wife and abandoned children out there. And this whole, this whole shtick that homosexuality and transgenderism doesn't hurt anyone is only possible if I don't have to see those people, Mm -hmm. if we throw those people away. And so, I, I mean, but but again, this was a figure, a person that was very significant in a transgendered body. 
And so I, I don't, it was, I, I just, it was, it was a combination of carelessness and false sentimentality. And then I just came to realize that it was just a sin. And, you know, all kinds of people talk to me about it. Like we would, well, first of all, I stopped doing it. I just kind of dropped it. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And, and, and then I realized, well, wait a second, I've course corrected, but that's not what you're supposed to do with sin. Like this is a sin. This was, I was a, this was a violation of the ninth commandment. I was lying. And furthermore, I remember reading in um, like Miriam Grossman's work and other people's work that social transition use. So uh, pronoun use would be part of usually considered to be part of a social transition. Right. That's really dangerous. That doesn't stay put. That condemns somebody to a track that you don't want. All every time I s- used Matthew's name, fake name as Jill, and then fake pronoun as her, I was condemning a person I claim to love and care for. Uh, and so I realized it wasn't enough to just course correct, because this wasn't like taking the wrong exit on a highway, which I do all the time, unless I have one of my children with me and they'll say, mom, this, you got to get off here. But, you know, you take a wrong exit on a highway, that, that's just a mistake. That's a dumb mistake, but it's a mistake. But sin has to be repented of. And then I read, I was reading in Thomas Watson's book, The Doctrine of Repentance, that course correction isn't an innocent move. Actually, the more that Christians course correct when they're supposed to repent, the more we have Aiken in the camp. Mm-hmm. And that's, and so when we, you know, like when I, I was thinking about it, well, why isn't God blessing, you know, why isn't, why do we, why is the world getting worse? Why is transgenderism increasing? Why, why are all these people writing to my website with these problems? Why does Target market tucking underwear, which used to be for drag queens for three-year-olds, what is going on? And then I started to think, oh, Rosaria, actually, you haven't repented of your sin, and God is not planning on blessing any of this until you do. And so I repent of my sin in the book. I also wrote an article last April that was published up at Ref 21 that gave an even fuller, and then it actually called out others, like, okay, I'll go first. Where are you? Where are you? And then I I did this thing that really bothers people. If, if repenting of sin isn't enough to bother people, I name names. And I'll tell you why I name names. And it's very radical. So I hope everybody just, you know, tightens up your, your chin straps. <laughs> I am an English professor, and I believe you really should cite your sources. Mm-hmm. That's why I name names. It's called citing your sources. Bad ideas have bad books behind them. And if those books are part of your library, maybe you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. If they're part of your thinking, maybe you need to do something about it. But honestly, it does sort of surprise me. I've had more people tell me that I should not have repented. And I'm thinking, you know, the only person I know who says you shouldn't repent of sin is Satan. So... It's more damning than anything if the evangelical world meets Rosaria Butterfield's public repentance with shock and awe. It's so apolitical, Rosaria. <laughs> Our politicians can't repent because they'll be crucified. But you have, as a, as a godly woman, and talking about having— inappropriate false books in our library. Uh, There's some really great books that could be there. And as I close, as an English professor and as an author, I'm sure you've read a few book reviews. And I'm guessing you may or may not have read any book reviews on your own book, The Five Lies. I read a few just to prepare to talk to you today. And and one just, I was really just amused by it. And actually, I I couldn't agree more with this reviewer. He's uh, from Minnesota. And he writes the 10 things he loves about your book. And number 10 is he says, Butterfield is courageous like Puddle Glum, speaking of a great series. And I, I didn't know anybody else out there like that Marsh Wiggle more than any other character in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles. But I love also Puddle Glum in The Silver Chair. And uh, he says, that's what Butterfield does in this book. She cuts through our culture's enchanting lies Uh, as opposed to the witch there. It's the dragon, the great dragon, with straightforward, liberating, beautiful truth. Our culture has the aroma of satanic enchantments. 
And Rosaria Butterfield's book has the aroma of burnt marsh wiggle. <laughs> uh, so the last two verses of Jesus' little discourse, powerful discourse in John 3 with Nicodemus, he said, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into it for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever, and one of those is Rosaria Butterfield, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what she has done has been done through God. So thank you uh, for this great book. Listeners, we, we've we just scratched the surface on all the good stuff inside this book. So I hope your, your website, where can our listeners go? RosariaButterfield.com is my website. Okay. Book's just been out a couple of months. And so I hope you'll, you'll check it out, listeners, uh, because I think it will, for so many different reasons, and we, we didn't even, we didn't get into feminism, so many things we didn't get into, but that's, that's okay, because our listeners can buy your book, and, you, and you'll appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Buy it and share it so that other people don't have to. How's that? Yeah. I'm, I'm all about book sharing. <laughs> so, Rosario, at the beginning of the program, before we actually got going, you had mentioned to me um, how important and encouraged you are by CMDA. Oh, Could you yes. just tell our listeners yeah, what CMDA has meant so, to you? So in the last three years, CMDA keeps coming up in my life, which is, which is a really interesting thing. I keep meeting medical doctors who in graduate school were able to hang on to their faith because they were part of CMDA. I, um, I, I mean, right now, a man who's dear to me and is part of our prayer meeting on Wednesday night is speaking to a CMDA group on how to be boldly a Christian in the workforce when it's really dangerous. And so, and, 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 and I think of CMDA as the place too, that is held on to the, you know, just the reality of maleness and femaleness, which sounds so obvious, but in a world that, you know, the, a truth that is right before your eyes, we're told in this Orwellian sense, no, you have to disagree with. And I have met people as I'm testifying before the North Carolina legislature and as I'm speaking before school boards, I have met Christians in those places for whom CMDA has been a resounding source of sanity and logic and courage, reminding medical doctors that they have to hang on to the basic truth, even in a world that has gone mad. This madness is part of the sickness that you as a Christian doctor are meant to heal. But it, you won't get there if you believe that the lies are true. And CMDA has been just courageous in its consistent reputation, even in my world as an English professor, up the way that it's helped, guided, and, and supported people in these times. You know, I, it's sort of a I don't mean it to be glib, but sometimes I do. I'll get up in the morning and my prayer is, Lord, may all the people I'm going to disappoint today be disappointed for your glory. Mm. And I can't think of a group more needing of that kind of prayer than medical doctors. And I don't think anybody would have thought 10 years ago no, that no you way. all would have to be on the front line of this, but you are. And just know that I've got your back back here. And um more importantly than that, so does the Lord. Well, someone who feels that strongly about this association, we need to get to our national convention someday and speak, so I hope you'll consider that someday, accepting our invitation. I will do my best. <laughs> Have you encountered a difficult patient care decision at your hospital? Do you have a question about how to maintain Hippocratic traditions within your work as a healthcare professional? We know our members are looking for resources on today's top bioethical issues, and we're here to help. CMDA's Ethics Hotline is an on-call program assisting members who are facing these difficult patient care decisions or questions. The hotline is provided by a panel of Christian ethicists who also formulate CMDA's ethical position statements that are based on scientific, moral, and biblical principles. You can reach the hotline by calling 423-844-1000 or by visiting cmda.org ethics. Well, I hope this interview with Rosari about how God's Word kept 
chipping away her heart and actually changed the course of her life that it intrigued you enough to make you want to learn more and to read her new book. And like she said, perhaps you might even share it with a friend after you've read it. You can find your copy of Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age at the new CMDA bookstore, which is powered by christianbook.com. You can simply visit cmda.org slash bookstore, and you'll find that book, along with her other books, including The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Practicing Radically Ordinary Hospitality in Our Post-Christian World. And while you're there, check out all the other CMDA resources that are available for you in the new CMDA bookstore. Again, you can find it by going to cmda.org slash bookstore. And if you'd like to find out more information about Rosaria, please be sure to visit her website at rosariabutterfield.com. We're excited to announce the newest addition to CMDA's long list of resources for our members, and it is specifically for students and residents. Called Standing Strong in Training, this new curriculum helps healthcare students and residents stand up against the cultural pressures facing Christians within healthcare today. The curriculum's seven modules are designed for group settings, allowing attendees to solidify their foundational worldview beliefs regarding important issues, such as the beginning of life, end of life, and biblical sexuality. Each module also offers ideas of how to winsomely defend biblical values and positively interact with others in developing their worldview beliefs. For more information and to download this free resource, visit cmda.org slash standing strong. I want to thank you for joining us this week on CMDA Matters. I'll be back next week, God willing, for an interview with Dr. Sam Alexander, who's a retired reproductive endocrinologist. He joined us to share about how God led him on a very interesting journey into short-term missions with CMDA's Medical Education International Ministry. And he, along with many others, were recently recognized by the Mongolian University of Health Sciences for a quarter of a century of impact in that nation. As always, if you'd like to suggest a future guest for our podcast, you can simply email us at cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like our podcast, would you be sure to give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform? Rosaria is so thoughtful and eloquent as she discusses these really hard and tricky topics. And I want to close out this week's episode with one especially poignant comment that she made that particularly applies to us as Christians in healthcare. Rosaria said, quote, This madness is part of the sickness that you at CMDA are trying to heal. Well, the madness of transgenderism that seems to have overtaken our American society in the last several years truly is a sickness. And God, I believe, is calling us as Christians in healthcare to help heal a suffering people. And the most important thing that we can do for our patients who are suffering from this madness and this sickness is to introduce them to the hope and healing of Christ, applying Christ's loving touch, if you will, to the pain and distress that they feel. That's what matters to CMDA, friends, and CMDA matters. I want to wish happy Thanksgiving to you and to your family, and we will see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate. Thank you.